Hey guys, welcome back to The Base Brief. This week we're talking about why we should get rid of the Espionage Act. A teacher's union says if layoffs happen, they will fire white teachers first. Marjorie Taylor Greene says discrimination against white men leads to porn. And will Andrew Yang's new third party succeed? Brad and I will react. Let's jump in. All right, so Brad, I know you can't tell because I've got my makeup on today, but I had the most intense facial of my life yesterday. Yeah, yesterday I asked you if you were going to make a video about something and you said, I can't. My face is uh, suffering from a, my facial <laughs> went wrong or something. I don't know. Tell no, What no, the no. heck happened? It didn't go wrong. It, it went exactly as it's supposed to. I just looked like a burn victim all day yesterday. So I got this new intensive, which really is kind of a cool new technology, but this new intensive laser facial that helps like with resurfacing of the skin and any like um, scarring you might have it reduces pore size Kim Kardashian's been doing it recently if that gives you some indication ah. how great it is but what they do is you have to have your whole face numbed for 30 minutes they put a numbing cream on you because that's how bad it's going to hurt you have to wear blackout goggles so the laser doesn't hurt your eye yes and then they rub this tiny little like laser all over your face repetitively for like four or five passes and it still burns and hurts so much even though you're numb they give you this little tube that blows cold air so you can at least blow cold air where your skin's being burned to <laughs> distract you from the fact that your skin is being burned off. So I did that. They were like, I was like, I have to do Kennedy tomorrow night. Am I going to be okay? And they were like, yeah. And, and sure enough, I woke up this morning and like the texture feels a little rough, but I'm not even red today. You look fine. So. You look great. Yeah. I think it, I just, this is another reminder to me. I'm so thankful I'm a man. Just there's so many things women have to deal with from periods to childbirth to makeup oh, yeah. to different especially in like the infotainment industry that we're in right the expectations on women are so much higher for their appearance it's like men will go on the on tv looking like pasty with their double <laughs> chin or whatever but if you're not like a really well put together woman it's very hard to succeed on tv sure. or as an influencer or what i yeah just part ten thousand of why i'm i'm <laughs> enjoying my privilege over here but Meanwhile, one thing I do have to do is stay kind of, you know, fit in order to to be, you know, you just got to have a good face if you if you want people to listen to you. It's just sad, but it's just how it is. But I've been eating way too much ice cream, to be honest with you. Every time we go to my boyfriend's hometown to see his parents or any family, we go to this place, Captain Sunday, and they make these like flurry style sundaes in a cup and they're just so good. So we go every single time. So now I've been out for ice cream the last two nights in a row. Uh, but hopefully I'll be able to burn it off because I'm now playing soccer twice a week, including on Tuesdays, which is a co-ed team. And I want to get your thoughts on this. So I just got to be honest. There's a, there's an imbalance between men and women in sports and in soccer, um, it manifests itself. So in co-ed, for example, in, in this co-ed team, uh, I usually play defense. I'm not the most offensively talented, but I played striker and scored three goals <laughs> in the last wow. match, uh, beca partly because it's a co-ed team. So I just, you know, have some physical advantages over the female players on the other team. And so I'm curious for your thoughts on this. For my first goal, I just get the ball with my back to goal. I turn with the ball, drop my shoulder, push her off the ball and score. And she's like on the ground and it's not a foul. If it's a male player, it would never be given as a foul. And the ref didn't give a foul. And she was, a, you know, she was really good. She was very athletic. She was a good sport about it. She didn't complain or anything. But some of the guys looked at me and were like, really? You're going to push a girl? And I'm like, yeah, if we're going to play co-ed, I'm not going to treat you any differently. Yeah. Isn't that a quality? I mean... I think that's exactly right. That's exactly how it should be handled. I, as um, one, a very not athletic person, but two, as a woman, would never put myself into a co-ed league of anything. Like, ugh. I try to play t like play tennis with Logan, and he's. it's not that he's even, like, so much better at tennis than me, but it's just the sheer, like, athleticism. He can hit a ball a lot harder than I can, right? Like, he'll spike it at me, not even meaning to. I'm like, watch it, dude. So don't put yourself in those situations unless you can hang because, honestly, like, Men are stronger than women. Sorry if that hurts your feelings. She, but... she didn't have any complaints. It was the men yeah. white knighting on her team that well, were mad. I think like, but I get that too, right? Like culturally, it's weird. Like you're not supposed to hit women. You really shouldn't hit anybody, right? But you're playing a sport. So like it just, it, it does introduce an awkward dynamic. And it's not where... hitting. It's like pushing. It's just like, yeah. you know, it, it's just kind of contact, like shoulder to shoulder. 
that happens when you play soccer. And honestly, I wasn't even really thinking about, is the defender next to me a girl or a boy? I'm like, I'm just right. playing how I would play. Uh, and I would do it again. I don't regret it for a second, but whatever. I don't, wrong. I don't think you did anything wrong at all. But I do understand like why that introduces a really awkward dynamic in sports. Never thought yeah. of uh, but I will say this about the female players on my team. You know, they're actually, like, technically and skill-wise better than a good number of the men. The thing that's different is just, you know, so, so for example, when they pass the ball, when they control the ball, when they shoot, it, they're as good or better. But the thing is, it's just, I don't know if it has to do with, like, uh, the fact that they have wider hips or that they're shorter or what it is, but it's just they're, they're just much slower. So, like, yeah. if a ball is going out of bounds and a male player was there, he would typically be able to get it, but it will just run out of bounds if one of the girls is chasing after it. Stuff like that will happen. And, you know, it's a fun league. It's It doesn't ruin the game at all because both teams are co-ed. Uh, I'm not saying that. I think co-ed's great. I'm just saying these differences obviously do exist. And when we get into, like, you know, politics and the trans sports debates and all those you can kind of tell who's ever played sports in a co-ed setting and who hasn't based yeah. on the pronouncements they make and how closely they depict reality yeah i i don't know i saw this thing it's not exactly the same but i saw this thing over the weekend about um alabama's rush program which i didn't do a sorority i didn't even go to alabama but i'm a big alabama fan so i keep track of some of these things and i think it was clay travis who's a sports journalist was like celebrating almost that this trans person tried to rush into an Alabama sorority and like was rejected by all of them. And I was just thinking about it and I was like, you know what? I just find these issues so hard because I feel really bad for that person. I feel very, very bad for that individual. But also that being said, it's really hard to get in a sorority. They reject lots of people for all kinds of reasons. Can we and assume that, that it's because they were trans? Do we even know that? I, the way the media is running with it is making it sound that way. But, but they I assume that kind of thing a lot. Right. I don't think the sororities came out and said that. But that being said, like, I just find all these issues to be really hard. And that's why I'm so against, like, political involvement in them, right? I feel really bad for people who are trans, who want to still participate in sports, who don't feel comfortable playing a, a sport you know, in a league with their old gender. It's a very complicated, messy, nuanced discussion when you get into these kinds of terrains and also like it, it really gets into like just your freedom of association as well like if you're in a sorority like you have freedom of association to make those decisions like there's a lot of black sororities and fraternities i'm pretty sure they wouldn't let white people in right they're historically black fraternities and sororities and so i just think all of this is so difficult and that's why i always say keep the government as far away from messy nuanced situations as you possibly can that's the last entity that can figure it out but when it comes to the sports thing i think you're right i've never played sports well, that's a lie. I tried to play sports. I was very bad at all of them, but I didn't play past high school anything, certainly. And I just think um, if you listen to people who are actually involved in these sports, like I, my heart goes out to everybody involved. I feel bad for the women who have spent their whole lives preparing to be really good at a sport. And then a trans woman comes in and just, just totally leaves them in the dust. And I feel bad for the trans people who want to still play sports. And yeah, I, it's just a tough situation. Yeah, I do agree with that. So last week, we covered the FBI's raid on Trump's house in Mar-a-Lago, Florida. The search warrant they executed has now been published. And one of the things we learned is that one of the things they're investigating Trump over is a violation of something called the Espionage Act. Now, they might get him on something else. They're investigating him on other unrelated things. But many people are pointing out that this law, the Espionage Act, actually shouldn't be on the books at all. And Hannah and I agree. So we actually published our first base politics editorial since our launch day uh, to call for this and to echo the argument from folks like Senator Rand Paul that this this law shouldn't be on our books anymore anyway because it's a violation of the First Amendment. But we have now learned that they are investigating Trump over this law. Take a listen to this clip from MSNBC. Among the statutes cited is 18 U.S.C. 18 is Title 18, which is the criminal code of the United States. Section 793, which comprises the Espionage Act and can include sections that I used to use to prosecute people who, um, you know, d retained unlawfully and disclosed unlawfully uh, classified information, information defined as information relating to the national defense. It's the most sensitive kind of information um, at issue. And that was one of the violations that undergirds this warrant. 
so Hannah, uh, the Espionage Act, we all agree spying is bad, right? <laughs> for, but the Espionage yeah. Act isn't actually about spying. Not really, not in practice. Tell us about the history of this law. Okay, so the history of this law dates back to World War I when we were under Woodrow Wilson, which my audience knows to hate FDR. I don't know if I've done my due diligence by you guys and helping you know how much you should hate Woodrow Wilson because he was also tyrannical, also racist, just a very, very problematic president in our history. So basically World War I is going on. Most historians would agree that's a war we should never have touched. We should not have been involved in it. Our involvement inevitably set the world stage for World War II and many of the laws and things that were passed during World War I are what Hitler used to basically rile up public support and come to power later on. So you can dig into all of that if you're a history buff, but one of those laws during that time was the Espionage Act and they passed it um, explicitly really to, to crunch down on dissent against the war. So Congress enacted the Espionage Act on June 15th of 1917, which was two months after the U.S. entered that war, and they did it to stifle dissent of U.S. involvement in the war, according to CBS. They say, in modern day, it's been used against those who leak classified information and those who remove classified information from secure facilities and store it at home. Um, the law at the time went after people who were being critical of the war and actually like this is kind of an interesting place where libertarians and socialist progressives can actually overlap because we tend to all be very consistently anti-war and at that time two very prominent socialists who were members of the socialist party Eugene Debs um, he was a prominent socialist and he was sentenced to 10 years for his criticisms of that war and another member of that party that was very prominent at the time was Charles Schneck and he was similarly prosecuted by the government for handing out flyers that basically just said the draft which Woodrow Wilson had imposed violated the 13th amendment and so from the very get-go this is something that has been used to not go after spies whatsoever it's been used to go after war dissenters and people who might publish information that would be critical of a war that might sway the public against it. Yeah, and we've now seen that continue into the modern day. Uh, for example, uh, Julian Assange, who we've talked about in the past, the journalist and co-founder of WikiLeaks, who published evidence that was leaked to him uh, by Chelsea Manning of literal U.S. war crimes. Uh, he was prosecuted and has been pro uh, persecuted under the Espionage Act. Right. But one of the experts that was quoted by CBS in this article we cited in our editorial literally said, the Espionage Act is not used to prosecute spies anymore. It's not about espionage. 90-something percent of the cases are not. It's about classified documents. So, of course, when Rand came out and said this, you had all these idiots in the replies saying he's pro-spying, he's a treason, he's pro-Putin, uh, including the guy running against him. Uh, just absolute bad faith attacks because just a minute ago, the left realized all the problems with the Espionage Act. Let's go to uh, the ACLU here for a second. The Espionage Act is a fundamentally unfair and unconstitutional law. This act is unconstitutionally vague because it allows the government to prosecute leakers and whistleblowers that it dislikes while leaving untouched the many leakers within the security state who release classified materials to advance those agencies' bureaucratic aims. As it stands, the Espionage Act makes no distinction between a civic-minded whistleblower who releases something that should never have been classified and which reveals illegal government activities and a spy who sells genuinely damaging documents to a foreign government for cash. That's the ACLU. And they say that the, the Espionage Act needs to be repealed and replaced with a fairer law. I find myself agreeing with that. I'm not an anarchist. I do think we should have a law against literal treason and espionage, selling foreign uh, classified information to hostile actors or terrorists. Or, But that's clearly not what the Espionage Act is and well, hasn't been for a long time. Let's be clear. Spying and espionage was already illegal before World War One. It's not like all of a sudden we realized spying was a problem and we had to pass this act real quick before we got to World War One. Like, no, per usual, the bill's name is disingenuous. It has very little to do with actually what its contents state and how it's been utilized. And so to suggest that getting rid of this is in any way pro-spying or makes you part of Russia Gate, that actually just makes you a conspiracy theorist and very, very, very uneducated 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 on the law and how it's been applied to people and how it's been used to target people and really how much it is a direct violation of the First Amendment. Because I don't think that if you even in a plain reading of this, you can see very clearly it was meant to hinder 
the First Amendment and free speech, and that's exactly how it's been used. And there's a reason, I think, that post-World War I, we enter this period of pretty much endless wars. You know, we get to World War II, and it's pretty much not stopped very much since then, especially since Vietnam. We are now a state that makes our primary business war. It's something that the average American is very uninformed on, that's really not talked about very much. You and I have even talked to people involved with base politics and said, we feel it's really important to elevate foreign affairs, and we're going to always be anti-war and talk about these issues. But the reality is it doesn't always get a lot of attention, doesn't always drive clicks. It's just not something that the American people really fully grasp the implications of. And I think that traces back to the Espionage Act because the media is scared to report on these things, at least in a meaningful and investigative way like we saw Julian Assange do. And when they use this kind of law to then persecute somebody like Assange, that scares the rest of the media from coming in and doing that very vital job. We need them to be reporting on our war crimes. We need them to report when our politicians are lying to us about the conditions happening in these wars and what our actual activities are in them and where we are actually guilty in carrying out um, genocide or, or war crimes against other people. So I think that it was always meant to go after the First Amendment and to go after a free press, and it has quite succeeded successfully done that. And so for them to go after Rand Paul, who has been one of the most consistent defenders of whistleblowers, of privacy, and against the military industrial complex and the intelligence community of all time, and say that he has other motives for this, I think that just makes you sound like a quack. Yeah, look, I agree. I, I just think it's also a, such a, a partisan watershed moment, because five minutes ago, liberals and, and true progressives opposed the Espionage Act. <laughs> but now it's being used against Trump. So they're like, oh, actually, this is good. Awesome. And, you know, to be fair, five minutes ago, a lot of these hawk Republicans were all about things like the Espionage Act and the FBI. And now they're saying, uh, abolish the FBI. This is all uh, security state dystopia. And I'm like, bro, well, yeah, you were fine until it was used against your guy. But I agreed with this sentiment from former Congressman Justin Amash, who tweeted, the fact that the Espionage Act may be used against Trump does not magically make it good. It has a terrible history of abuse. Government has employed it to avoid scrutiny and chill free speech, and it violates basic tenets of due process. Nobody should be cheering this law. I think that's what we fundamentally agree with. And so we uh, support the effort to repeal the Espionage Act. And, you know, if that can't be done, there are other efforts to reform it that are underway that are also worthy of support. But I just think this is a good opportunity because it's in the news right now with them going after Trump. And again, they might get him on something else. Who knows? He's. It wouldn't shock me if he's committed crimes. Uh, he's not the most with classified information. I don't think of him as the most methodical <laughs> of, of people. Um, but the fact that they're going after him under this law, I don't care whether it's Trump or whether it's a liberal or anyone, this law should not exist as it is currently written. And we're here to say that regardless of party or, or tribe. Yeah, I think this is why Trump should never be your litmus test. He's certainly not above book. But when we have things like this come about, it's disappointing that, you know, you have the left that say they are anti-war and they're against some of these spying techniques and they're pro-free speech. And then the minute they actually have an opportunity to get the right with them, they throw that opportunity under the bus because it's more important to them to go after Trump than it is to actually get something meaningful done. And that's just such a disappointment. Um, but I am proud to say that, that the, we support full repeal of the Espionage Act, but there also is a reform bill in place, and it's bipartisan. It has Thomas Massey on the right who signed on to it, and it has uh, Representatives Ro Khanna and Ron Wyden, who if you don't know them, you should. They're pretty base Democrats when it comes to things like war, when it comes to things like privacy. They often are teaming up with us on those ideas. And so I think that shows you the people who are meaningfully and consistently concerned with these larger overarching issues are doing the right thing right now and are, are finding bipartisan ways to work on this. So um, keep your eyes on those people. Okay, now that we have covered systemic corruption, let's move on to systemic racism. In case you missed it in the news this week, according to Fox News, an agreement between the Minneapolis Federation of Teachers Union and the school district now states that white teachers will be laid off before teachers of color, regardless of their seniority. 
And this agreement came out, it was reached after a two week teacher strike that occurred last spring. Uh, and basically the situation is saying there's not layoffs happening right now, but should layoffs be needed due to budget reasons or because when kids leave schools, um, some portion of that money follows the kids. So you have a lot of kids leaving schools right now for a very good reason. And that means some schools are losing money, which we applaud those schools should lose money because they shut down and took away kids education for two years for no freaking reason. Um, but what happens is that then sometimes schools have to downsize. So basically they're saying if and when, uh, schools in our district have to downsize. Instead of saying uh, you've been here the longest or you've been here the shortest amount of time or even better saying like you have better test scores or a better teacher, they're going to decide these matters based on race. Um, so if the person who's been there the least amount of time is a person of color, they'll go to the next level of seniority um, and look for a white person to fire. That's basically how it's going to function. Yeah, I'm this dead serious. This I, I, this is just a good reminder to me of that saying that's like, if you become too open-minded, your brain falls out. It's like you become so woke and far left that all of a sudden you're like doing the same thing as the literal KKK white supremacists, but in reverse. Like firing people on the basis of their race or making employment decisions on the basis of skin color is wrong. I, that's <laughs> apparently a radical sentiment now. I mean... Look, this is just one union in one place, but it's like they really are this on the extremes of the woke left. They're going off into this terrain, but also like like Hannah, is this not illegal? It sounds incredibly illegal to me. Well, I want to get to that in a minute, but I'm not done. So one, it's not just a localized thing happening because this teachers union has actually said what they're trying to do is create a nationwide model that other teachers unions can use, and in the agreement. It not only says that white teachers will be fired first, it also says that when bringing teachers back on, when making rehiring decisions, the district shall prioritize the recall of a teacher who's a member of a population underrepresented among licensed teachers in the district. And according to the agreement, uh, they're taking these actions to make up for past racism that went the other direction. They say this will solve past discrimination by the district that disproportionately impacted the hiring of underrepresented teachers in the district as compared to the relevant labor market in the community and resulted in a lack of diversity of teachers. So basically, they're saying we are going to implement more racism to solve past racism, which is just mind blowing, like absolutely mind blowing. But back to your question, is this legal? I did some digging because I was pretty curious too. It seemed on its face just blatantly illegal based on the Civil Rights Act and just the Constitution and the 14th Amendment. Um, so I dug in and according to Hans Bader, who's a constitutional lawyer, he says the measure is outright unconstitutional. Um, this is a quote from him. He says, when it comes to termination, an employer can't racially discriminate even against whites. The Third Circuit Court of Appeal ruled in 1996 in a case called Taxman versus Board of Education of Piscataway that a school district can't consider race even as a tiebreaker in deciding who to lay off, even to promote diversity, because that A, unduly trammels the white teacher's rights, and B, putting that aside, the school district couldn't consider race to promote diversity when black people weren't seriously underrepresented in its workforce as a whole. He also argued that the Third Circuit's ruling is strengthened by a 1989 Supreme Court ruling, uh, Wygant versus Jackson Board of Education, that stated that a school district can't lay off white teachers to remedy societal discrimination against black people. So I I can't think of any reason that I would push back on this. It, I think it's not a, I think it's not legal. I mean, you've got the so many laws, right? These are public schools, so you've got the equal protection clause. You've got the Civil Rights Act. Uh, it's like you can't uh, I, I, what? But I will say, and we know this, um, oftentimes when it comes to litigation, there are many groups on both the left and the right who will knowingly pass a law or do something like this, form an agreement that they know to be unconstitutional, that they know is illegal for the direct purpose of trying to escalate it and get different legal precedent. So I don't know if that's their strategy. I don't, I'm really not sure, but I, I can't envision a way this doesn't get struck down, but that being said, I would imagine there's some kind of strategy or an intentionality here behind that decision, because otherwise, why waste your money fighting this kind of thing in court? But aren't you glad but, that teachers unions have control over our kids in <laughs> most schools in this country and that they're beholden to by the Democrats? Isn't this a great group of people to be in? Not that they're all responsible for this one union, but I would be shocked if any of them are condemning it. Like, show me Randy Weingarten, the head of the biggest teachers union, condemning this. 
if it's out there, I'll acknowledge it, but I don't hold your breath. Right. Well, I saw this um, woman I see on Twitter sometimes named Sunny Johnson. I think she's somebody who's in like the conscious black conservative movement, if I'm not mistaken. But she said, the union admitted it was racist in its hiring and firing processes. This is their solution. How are you going to be mad at the racist solution, but not the racism they admitted caused the problem in the first place? To which I said, sounds like teachers unions are pretty racist and always have been. Shouldn't they just be banned? I mean, and this is a long standing. I mean, let's be very, very candid. I have been anti public sector unions, period, for many, many years. I think that they should be abolished. I think that basically public sector unions allow government officials to use our tax dollars against us. They use them to lobby against us. They use them to shut down dissent. They use them to curtail our um, representation in the actual political process at state legislatures and school boards and and city councils across this country i hate public sector unions i hate all taxpayer funded lobbying and i think that it is a perversion that has led to a severe erosion of our system so i'm just gonna like put that out there but i do think with teachers unions there are so many problems right they are, they have such a stranglehold on the education system, on our dollars, we're spending $15,000 per kid per year on average and getting worse and worse and worse results. That money is not going to the kids, it's not going in the classroom, it's going into the union's pockets, which then get transferred over to the Democrats' pockets, it's going into the administrative pockets. Um, and as a whole, it's, it's a real, it's a corrupt scheme. And then on top of that, they had the audacity to then shut down schools, force kids into mass, force kids into separating and, and led to all kinds of social anxiety, led to real severe developmental delays where kids, I've been around kids lately, they, they don't know how to talk to each other, it's bizarre. They don't know how to interact or play or like approach one another. They, they led to serious lack of educational outcomes that some kids will never be able to make up. And then they tried to use the Department of Justice and the FBI to go after parents who had the audacity to protest this kind of thing at school boards and try to label them domestic terrorists. These people are thugs. And I'm really, I think this is just cherry on top. They're racist to boot. So let's get rid of them. They should be banned. Yeah, look, I don't have a lot to disagree with there. Um, I, I agree, public sector union, I'm fine with private sector unions as long as they're strictly voluntary, but the public sector unions, the very concept is problematic. And I think, I mean, you can even go back to who was it? Was it JFK who agreed with us on this? Uh, but not too it long. Was FDR. It, oh, was it was FDR. It was FDR, <laughs> yes, FDR. His one good take of his entire <laughs> life. Yes, his one good take that we agree on. I can't remember, I think I wrote about that for Fee years ago. But yeah, he actually agreed with us that public sector unions were a real perversion of our system and hurt democracy and should not exist. Um, so we agree with him on that. Now, that all being said, I'm mad at the left for the teachers unions. I'm mad at them for supporting these unions. But then I saw another kind of reaction to this news story over the past couple of days from the right that just got under my skin. I'm gonna, lead, I'm gonna read you one tweet that kind of encapsulates it. This is from Jesse Kelly, who's sort of a populist Republican type. And he quote tweeted Fox News' report on the story and he said, man, the racism is starting to sound dot, 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 what was that word? Dot, 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 systemic. And I just, ugh. Listen, you're not wrong. This is systemically racist, but the fact that you can only see and acknowledge it when it finally and inevitably comes for you and people you like or people who look like you, that is infuriating to me because these are the same, the same people who, when I was doing criminal justice reform work and talking about the extreme amounts of systemic racism in the system, in the justice system, consistently told me that I was making it up, that it wasn't true, that racism was dead, that this was just you know, a total pile of hogwash and they would never look at the stats, they'd never look at the data and it infuriated me because it is so overt, the systemic racism in our system. And it's not just within the justice system, it is within the public school system, it is within the gun control debate. We could talk in the housing market. There's so many areas that our history of slavery and Jim Crow continue to impact and the fact that people won't acknowledge that I don't understand it. We know the government is corrupt. We know the government hurts people. Why, if you support limited government, would you go to bat and say it's not racist? You know, I've always thought that was a really weird stance people took on the right. And this is the kind of thing that, again, I, I can't stand the hypocrisy when you don't care when it's happening to other people for decades, for centuries. And now all of a sudden you can recognize it? Like, come on. Yeah, I agree with you in the sense that I've always thought the way that the left and, and hardcore progressives talk about systemic racism is often overblown or they, they I don't fully agree with it, but the concept itself is not illegitimate and as to me has always obviously applied 
to things like the criminal justice system. Um, and, and I think you can't go and say systemic racism doesn't exist. Then you find one example of anti-white racism and say, look, systemic racism. I mean, you just, first of all, America is not systemically racist against white people. It's the most absurd thing I've ever heard. Now, this one union was being discriminatory against white people, and that's bad. But that does not make systemic racism and it certainly doesn't if you're the same folks who believe systemic racism isn't real at all for black people so i guess look again this is just like a, a tribes thing it's back to what we were talking about earlier people will flip and flop their positions on various issues depending which team it's affecting right now and that is a terrible way to approach politics uh with any sense of principle or integrity because it's just you can't Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm with you. I think the left does use systemic racism disingenuously at times and, and for more collectivist end goals than get rid of the system that's racist, right? Their, their solution to systemic racism makes absolutely no sense. But as a whole, like the, the inability of people to acknowledge it when it's not occurring to people. That I also might. think they paint with too broad a brush. Like the idea that America is a racist country mm -hmm. is a very different statement than America's criminal justice system has systemic racial discrimination embedded into it, yeah. which one of those things is true and objectively true. Mm -hmm. uh, and then one of those things is overly broad, ignores all the positives, ignores tremendous progress, uh, you know, disparages ideals that we all hold. Like, because I think the story of America is a story of taking a long time to live up to beautiful promises and principles. Whereas I think sometimes the left systemic racism crowd starts to like tarnish the idea itself, right? Yeah. Or the principles themselves, rather than say our system is, is flawed and discriminatory and is not living up to our ideals, they castigate the very ideals themselves. And that's mm -hmm. why I'm not on board with, with that movement. Yeah. Well, to be clear, they hate our founding principles. They hate our ideas. They hate capitalism. They hate individualism. Like, of, of course, that is 110 percent accurate so no pushback from me there um the last thing i want to bring up here is you know we continue to talk about how the outcomes from public schools are getting worse and worse and worse and they are and i think that you can point to decisions like this as one of those reasons when we look at even how they are making staffing decisions and i experienced this my mom taught in the public school system for a very brief period of time because she hated it and it was terrible um, they very rarely look to promote good teachers, look to promote people who are teaching creativity or like even people who are producing the best test scores. And instead, there's a ton, ton of nepotism. There's a ton of hiring decisions that are being made based off criteria like this presented by this union. And I think that's why your kids in, uh, can't read and write ultimately, right? Like you're, they're not actually looking at what is best for the kids, who are the best teachers, how do we make sure that more teachers like that get hired? That has little to do with how they're making decisions in the classroom. And I just find that to be such a slap in the face. And no wonder we don't have good people going into this profession. Yeah, so. I completely agree. Uh, they, this is not how we shouldn't be making hiring decisions on the basis of race. We should be making them on the base or seniority. We should be making them on the basis of merit. How oh, that's a radical thought. But now, Hannah, it's time to talk about porn. <laughs> nice segue. <laughs> All and right, Marjorie let's... Taylor Greene. All right, guys, we don't talk about Marjorie Taylor Greene very often just because we don't often have much we agree with her on. Um, if you aren't familiar with her, she we're going to call her MGT. Or wait, MTG. What's her acronym? MTG. MTG. Her, her name's a bit of a mouthful. She's kind of what I like to call the rights AOC because she's pretty out there most of the time. Uh, and as a whole, I don't think is somebody that... 20 years ago you would have seen an office just based on her conduct alone like she she really gets a little weird but that being said she gave an interview over the weekend where i actually halfway agreed with her and i want to roll this clip does everything tell you guys through through hollywood through through you know books through through music through through our entire culture is that that white men are bad white men you know they're bad they 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 have to be pushed to the back they shouldn't be listened to but what that's done to uh, your generation and, and even a little, some of those a little older than you and those definitely younger than you is it has created hopelessness in, in many of these guys. Hopelessness, they're lost. They, they grow up in a broken home or maybe a, just a really bad home. Um, no one is there for them as they're growing up. They spend time hours and hours alone. 
uh, which is what do they do with their time when they're alone? They don't have an after school job if they're in high school. Maybe they don't, they probably don't play a sport. So they're spending hours and hours time alone, which turns them to all kinds of bad things, uh, porn on the internet, reading crazy stuff in, in chat rooms and God knows who's in there and saying what they're saying. Um, a lot of time playing playing video games. And I know people don't like to demonize video games, but I, I do think that maybe has a role there for certain people. Um, All right, Brad, I'm curious to hear your initial reaction because this was sent to me and I thought I was going to have like a slam dunk kind of like haha moment. And then I was like, eh, she's got a little bit of a point. So I honestly don't agree with you. Like I thought yeah. the clip was absurd. I mean, I just <laughs> don't believe, I, I get what I, there's a little grain of truth that I get like, that diversity politics and identity politics have run so amok that like we're now um white men in some elements of culture could feel castigated or whatever but it's like day-to-day -day america is not in any way shape or form disparaging or discriminatory to white men it's just not true like i lived my whole life as a white man and i think only in like woke college classes was I like made to feel like looked down upon about that? Or, you know, on Twitter, I've gotten comments like, oh, t the dismissing my opinion because I'm privileged or whatever. It's like, it, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but this idea that for normal people in real life every day, you're going to face any obstacles because you're a white man. I just think that's totally wrong. I think it's like a super very online perception of if you read The Guardian every day and look at what like, rainbow flag blue check people are tweeting about you might feel this and maybe in some corners of culture but just in general life like white men are thriving and successful in every aspect of life they're the face of most of our like top media people our top politics our top you know athletes in many sectors uh top models it's just like they're top marketed to in terms of so many things i just don't get it and i think that she's identifying real problems when it comes to like homelessness or, or um, isolation and but i think just like she's not talking about any of the real problems that are causing them that often have to do with economic factors and uh the many ways our system is is rigged against people or fatherlessness i think is such a much bigger factor in what's going on with men and i've written about this than anti-white bias and also at, just at the end she goes off about video games come on this the whole video game thing video vi video games don't cause violence uh, they don't cause mass shootings any of this is all debunked nonsense there can be addiction problems uh i've i've experienced a little bit of that myself but just by and large i i honestly thought that she was this was kind of like a right wing victim script, but there are, I guess there are some real problems identified. So I'm curious for what, for your thoughts for sure. Well, I agree with you. It's not 1999 and Eminem and video games are not making you shoot up schools. I think we covered that in those hearings back then. So I agree with everything you just said. And I really always, this is one reason I don't like her. Like it's not just a victim complex on the right. It is specifically a white victim complex, right? Where she is a white nationalist type and she always sees white people as the victim. And I think that's ridiculous and absurd. I also think it's odd to say this because uh, white men are not the only ones playing a lot of video games and consuming porn, right? All men, not all men, I don't mean all men, but like all types of men have issues with these two addictions, right? Yeah. So I think it's really silly. But to say that there is not a problem going on with men, and this is where I agreed with her, I think there is a real hopelessness um, epidemic occurring within men in our country. I think there's a loneliness epidemic occurring within men as a whole. I don't think men are thriving in our society. And it's not to say that they're victims. It's not to say like everything's working against you. I don't think I take it to where she takes it. But what I do think is happening is that gender norms have moved very, very quickly, right? You had men that for decades and decades and decades were the breadwinner. They controlled all the finance. They had these positions in society that they got just by sake of being men because the system was structured to prevent women from working or opening bank accounts or getting credit cards without them. And now they're in this new dynamic where I think women have gotten a lot of assistance in recent decades to say, here's how you start a business. Here's how you get through to your degrees. Here's how you thrive. You know, here's how you overcome the systemic history of oppression that you've had, you know, that your mother faced, that your grandmother faced, and here's how you overcome it. And we see some of the um, results of that. We see that women are graduating college at higher rates. They're starting to earn more money than men. They're really seeming to thrive in a lot of ways, whereas men, um, don't seem they seem more stagnant 
I think is the best way to put it. I don't think is that they're being oppressed or pushed down, but I don't think they figured out, many of them, how to thrive in the new economy, how to thrive in relationships. And, and I think that this is an interesting thing to examine because so often, and I've seen this because I've put out content about the men's rights movement, I've talked about some of these issues facing men, specifically um, the psychological issues that men are facing right now because I think that they haven't been given the same tools and techniques to overcome things like depression and anxiety that women often get. And there's more of a stigma uh, for them getting treatment in society as well. Yeah. But I, I think that that's where I'm with her. Um, I posted this article on my Facebook earlier this week that I thought was really interesting. Like sometimes I post things as just sort of case studies on socioeconomic conditions. And this you just want to drop of... a bomb and see what the comments section says. Yeah, like I kind of use this for my own like research into society. And so the article um, was pretty benign, actually. It was from Psychology Today, which is a, an outlet I like to read a lot. And it was called The Rise of Lonely Single Men. And my excerpt from it, I kind of just regurgitated what it says. I said, women have more choices than ever in the dating pool, and they want men who are good communicators, emotionally available, and who have shared values. For many men who are still not being taught these soft skills, that's a deficit they're going to have to address. Now, nothing I said is untrue, right? They're, this is why men have to pay to be on dating apps, and women can get on there for free. Women have a lot more options. They, we know that just biologically, they typically pick their mates more than men picking their mates because they have more options. They have more say over who they want to procreate with, settle down with, et cetera. Um, and so we see that both, uh, both genders increasingly are at least waiting until later in life to get married, but we see a growing number of people who aren't getting married at all. And we know that marriage, while it can be beneficial for both genders, is actually better for men. Men thrive when they're married. They tend to have better psychological outcomes, better financial outcomes even, and have happier home lives and get more out of marriage than women. And so this article was just addressing this. When I tell you the men in my comments were heated, <laughs> They were heated. It got ratioed on Facebook. I think it had like 900 likes and like over a thousand comments. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah it was it was really really interesting. And obviously, we what don't were they mad them. about exactly? Most of them were saying something like this guy who said, "And what do women have to offer?" <laughs> um, a lot of them were saying like, "I don't even I don't even mess with women anymore. I don't even talk to women anymore. I don't want anything to do with them. We're choosing to be alone. We're choosing to be single." Yeah, like very um, Are just you very. Are you um, very anti women comments to which a lot of my other people were coming in and saying a lot of dudes upset about this in the comments or a lot of people proving the original post right in the comments. Uh, one person said these comments do not pass the vibe check and tagged a group this is that is called this is why there aren't more women in the liberty movement. So the reactions were um, pretty exaggerated, but I think even in talking about some of the issues facing men, you see this very emotional like guttural reaction from men right where they're very defensive and and it comes out very quickly in their comments that they're pretty mad at women they're pretty mad at the state of things and i do agree with her that some of these feelings do drive things like porn consumption right if you don't if you feel like it's not worth your effort or you have this mentality that women aren't going to give you a fair shot right everything's stacked against you then you are more likely to pull away from real meaningful connections and interactions and go watch a bunch of porn and not do much with your life i think porn yeah. is a very damaging industry as a whole um, I'm not, you know, for banning it. I'm a libertarian. I think people can do what they want and it should be acceptable in the free market. But do I think it's healthy to consume a lot of porn? Absolutely not. Yeah. So I, I guess what I'll say about um, MTG's comments is take the white part out of it because I really don't buy the anti-white bias is rife in our society narrative. And yeah. I talk about problems facing men in 2022. And I think there's a lot more there that's that rings true. Though, again, I think like the causes of it are complicated. And I also think some of it, not all of it, but some of it is that when you were previously on top and had things biased in your favor, equality can sometimes feel like you're being disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. I mean, maybe like for a long time, men felt entitled to act a certain way toward women. And now women have options and they... There's a lot more awareness over things like sexual harassment. I just think part of it may be a rebalancing of the field that feels like things are being tilted against them, but really they're being balanced back. I don't know. I'm, but at the same time, I, like there are a lot of problems facing men. I think fatherlessness is a huge, huge thing uh, that has affected so many men. And also masculinity is a very interesting concept. I think there's been very 
substantive and legitimate critiques of toxic masculinity, but yet there's not been uh, enough space or credence or models for positive masculinity, what it looks like. Um, I just, to me, the most damning thing is that there's this like YouTuber who created an account that's, that's called like, dad, how do I, or something, I forget, but he makes these videos like teaching you how to tie a tie or how to change a tire or whatever. And it's like the idea is if you don't have a dad to teach you these things and all his videos have like five, 10 million views. Right. And, And like that to me reveals something that I think is a real problem. And it might be part of what the Congresswoman was touching on here and what these men um, in their fifis in your comments, where they're coming from. Yeah, I love that you point that out because in, in my initial comment saying what women want are good communicators and emotionally available men, to me, that's a true man, right? Somebody who's capable of not only being strong in a physical way, but being strong in an emotional and a mental way. and. And I did not post that in a way that was meaning to be derogatory towards men, but rather in saying like, these are soft skills we need to come along and help men learn because simply showing up and having a paycheck, that's not enough anymore. Women have their own paychecks. We need to figure out ways to be actual partners to one another and to have these cohesive and actually equal relationships. Not to say that there's not you know differences in the sexes and relationships, so I think there are, but finding ways that we can actually step up and, and be um, people who come to each other's aid and like assist one another in ways that go beyond finances and these traditional structures is imperative because you know, I've been in the dating pool. It's Things aren't going well right now. I don't think it's going well for women. I don't think it's going well for men. I think as a whole, people are pretty dissatisfied with one another. These are conversations we need to be having about where we're at in society and how do we come along and assist men in developing these soft skills and learning to like have a deeper sense of what it means to be masculine and to be a man. And it, it has so much more to do than beating your chest, right? So that's, that's where I kind of agreed with her on, but I thought she obviously didn't go far enough in, in describing some of these things. But interesting interview. All right, speaking of interesting interviews, Andrew Yang gave an interesting interview on CNN over the past week with a reporter named Jim Acosta. Um, If you're not familiar with Andrew Yang, he is a very successful businessman who ran for president in 2020 in the primaries for the Democratic Party, Um, but he quickly became very dissatisfied with the party itself and with what he was just seeing as far as tribalism across the two sides. And he decided to try to start a third party, which he's called the Forward Party. Um, And Brad and I have been watching this. We're we're interested, right? We're people who believe that the two-party system needs to be broken in this country. It creates all kinds of issues. It's one of the biggest root problems in our society. Um, And we we are generally very pro-third party. Um, due to an immense amount of rigging of the system, true, true election rigging, it's very hard for third parties to succeed. I did a whole episode of the OG series of based on this, if you want to go watch it on YouTube or on our podcast, um, digging into the ways that we've actually legally prevented third parties from competing in this country. That being said, um, there's often the sentiment that because they don't succeed, they're not wanted. I think that's vastly untrue. I think people are desperate for third parties and more options. Um, And so while I don't agree with Andrew Yang on a ton as far as his policies that I can tell, I've been I've been watching and observing and I will say I really like most of the rhetoric I've seen him putting out seems very optimistic, very inviting, opening, welcoming and like just has a a real like energizing sort of feel to it. and, and I think that's actually, I hate to say it, the opposite of how the LP often sounds or the Green Party often sounds. And so it's, it's just been interesting to observe because I think that is how you should message if you want to bring new people into a new sort of apparatus. But I, I've, I've struggled to know what his party is actually about. As far and as that's where this interview comes out. You talked about Andrew Yang, who ran for president, and he's like this independent guy. He's definitely more on the liberal, neoliberal, technocratic side, but he genuinely seems like a really nice person who wants to solve problems and seek compromise and not demonize others. Um, and so that's why I think we approach this with a positive attitude toward him. Uh, and also a positive attitude, as you mentioned, to the idea of third parties and breaking the system. But I thought that in this CNN interview with Jim Acosta, um, Yang, some questions were asked that are very, very gaping about his forward party. But to be clear, though, the interview just began with Acosta being a jerk. Take a listen. Um, Is this an attempt to pump up book sales? Well, uh, I'd have to say this would be a pretty silly way to go about it, given that we (laughs) have co-founded a national party. Uh, that now has tens of thousands 
of Americans signed up, uh, co-chaired by former governor of New Jersey, Christine Todd Whitman. And the fact is 62% of Americans- But are you just promoting yourself, I guess is what I'm, I guess what I'm asking is, are you just out there promoting uh, yourself <laughs> with this? Uh, again, Jim, that there, there are, as you can uh, easily imagine, there are hundreds of better ways uh, to go about uh, promoting a, a, a book than starting a political party to do so. I mean, I, I'm building this party because 62% of Americans want it. We're more polarized than ever. And the fact is the two parties have divvied up the country so that 79 to 90% of races are uncompetitive. Most of the people watching this right now aren't even living under a two-party sister system. They're living under one party. So Hannah, to me, it's pretty obvious that uh, Acosta is being a jerk. He's making this interview way more hostile and personal than it needs to be. And I don't think Yang's doing this to just promote himself. He could be uh, just, you know, funneling money towards paid ads and uh, he's, he's independently wealthy. Like, I think he's coming from an earnest place. I think he did a good job explaining why we need a third party. So that's just the first bit of this. We'll get into the, the you know, where it kind of derails in a sec. But that was my initial impression of this interview was was really not positive towards Jim Acosta here. Well, Jim Acosta is always a jerk. That's kind of his stick, right? Like I've never really found him to be a super likable guy. But yeah, I, I agree with you. I think, again, I think Andrew Yang seems genuine. He seems like a nice person. He seems like someone who genuinely wants to come in and find solutions. And I think he experienced just how unworkable the two-party system is. He realizes he's in a position of prominence and he has the wealth to maybe do something about it. So as far as that goes, I say kudos, all the applause in the world, right? There's so many people who have wealth and positions of power who don't undertake this, who don't try to come in and do this because it's hard and you're going to have a lot of vitriol spewed your way. And as a whole, you're going to really put yourself in a position where you're hated and your family's hated. And you have to go have media interviews like this where people are mean to you. Like, I really fail to think that somebody would just do this as a self-serving sort of um, means. If you, if you were really self-serving, you'd go the easy route and run for the Democrat Party and just govern how you want. So, yeah. yeah. I agree. I, I think it's not about self-promotion. But I do think this effort that Yang is launching with the forward party may be hopelessly naive. And it may be just not really sufficient as a political project. Like, let me read you from the website for the Forward Party, uh, w what they say they're all about. Welcome to the Forward Party. Forward Party is fighting for the American people with practical, common sense solutions. While other political parties look to divide America into different camps, the Forward Party aims to bring them together. Join us on the most critical mission of our era, building the foundation for a representative and stable democracy. Not left, not right, forward. I feel like I just read a bunch of words that don't say anything. Mm-hmm. That's how I often feel when I get into politics. I'm like, but what do you want to do? <laughs> you know, I just, but they don't. I think that's part of the, the whole dog and pony show of politics is never being explicit about what you actually want to do and achieve. But again, this is why I've, I've been curious, I've been watching, you know, and I'm, I'm always rooting for there to just be more options in our system, but it has been so impossible for me to tell if there's, you know, anything there for me and, and that sort of, but you know, we're not party people. You and I are both just extreme independents, I think, who probably, and, and this is what I've always said, I think as a whole, uh, I think the, the barriers to overcome for third parties are so significant and so entrenched in our system that the work that would have to be done to get a third party where it could actually be competitive, the money, that it would require is ghastly. And it doesn't actually seem to be the pragmatic way forward. I also firmly believe that any political party that does come to power and get to that gets to that point will become corrupted because I think the very nature of parties is corrupt and leads to binary thinking. And I think that's why George Washington warned us about them all the way back in his farewell address. So I'm, I'm curious, I like Yang, but I, I don't really know that this right. is where I, put my hopes and dreams. <laughs> no, because they just don't stand for anything. I mean, listen to this second clip. And the moderate population in both parties is unfortunately dwindling quickly. So the political incentives end up dis, uh, disproportionately empowering the 10% of extremes on both sides. But you're going to have to come up with policy really positions. negative results. Right, we but just Andrew, need a better system. Yeah, but Andrew, you're going to have to have policy uh, positions at some point. How does the forward party feel about Roe versus Wade? Should it have been overturned? Well, I personally uh, think that women's reproductive rights are fundamental human rights, but the forward party has 
uh, not left or right, but forward stance on even the most divisive and contentious issues. Well, what does that mean? Don't you have to take a position on something? You don't you have to take a position on something? You can't just say, well, I, you well, know, this is a hot button issue, so I'm not going to take a position on you. You know, if you want to run the country, you're going to have to make some hard decisions, Andrew. Uh, again, the forward party is about that common sense consensus majority view, which is very clear on abortion. It's clear. What about on guns? What guns? about it's assault clear weapons? On climate change. It's actually clear on just about every issue under the sun. Should eight. So it's like, what is your position on abortion, guns, whatever? Well, I have my own position, but somebody else can be in the party and have the total opposite. We just common sense, middle of the road. Blah, blah, blah. It's like you have to have positions. You have to stand for something. You can't have a party that's just this kind of vacuous open tent of people who like buzzwords. I really like Andrew Yang. I understand the spirit of what he's going for, but like you got to stand for something. Let's look at the website again, the forward party's priorities. Uh, I'll read you this. It's three priorities will unite our broad coalition and serve as the springboard for policymaking by forward party candidates and leaders at all levels. Free people. Revitalize a culture that celebrates difference and individual choice, rejects hate, and removes barriers so that each of us can rise to our full potential. Thriving communities. Reinvigorate a fair, flourishing economy and open society where everyone can live a good life and is safe in places where we learn, work, and live vibrant democracy reform our republic to give americans more choices in elections more confidence in a government that works and more say in our future then their three main policy proposals are ranked choice voting nonpartisan primaries and independent redistricting commissions set aside whether you think those are good ideas or not it's like all just political and election based it's like and, and these are all just everyone wants a, a culture that celebrates difference and individual choices. Everyone wants a, a fair and flourishing economy. How are you going to get us there? What's your policy on the minimum wage, on the corporate tax, on tax increases, inflation, the Federal Reserve, like regulation, trade, immigration? Like you can't just have an agenda. This is their supposedly their platform. You can't just have an agenda that's just about buzzwords. And everyone, every American would agree with this because you might as well just ask them, do you want a happy, rich society where everyone gets along and we all eat unicorn farts? It's like just hopelessly naive to me. So I agree with all that. I think it is just a lot of fluff. And I really do think a lot of the things they elevate, they are things that people want but I don't, I see them as activities that would be carried out without, like ranked choice voting, for example, is something that would largely be achieved through ballot initiatives. That's not really something that you need a political party to get to. I think this is where I tend to come down, is that I like Andrew Yang. I think he's very genuine. I love the idea of more parties, but I think he started this um, from a place where he didn't have that much experience in politics in general and doesn't really, he's not in the weeds, right? This isn't somebody who's been a lobbyist is not somebody who's been super in, ingrained in, in getting things done in the political system. And, and that's not even a knock at him. I think that you can still achieve great things if you haven't done those things, but you need to talk to the people who have because you're gonna find out some things pretty quickly. And so to me, this initiative just seems a little bit unnecessary and aimless. And I think the things he'd like to get done could be better achieved outside of a political party and probably would be a lot um, more affordable would be a lot more realistic of a lift and and that's that's kind of disappointing i hate seeing money get wasted in politics because there's so much that needs to get done and i'm like there are so many ways that you can actually get big things done with a pretty shoestring budget i can't talk today pretty shoestring budget and so i would love to see these kinds of people sit down with actual policy wonks or with people who spend a long time moving legislation and getting things done politically and find out ways that they can be more effective and use their resources better yeah, I mean, look, I would love to see more ranked choice voting. I think that's that you start a coalition to get that passed state by state, focusing on a single issue, but not a whole political party. And I mean, the folks that have been friendly to or loosely associated with this range from everything from libertarians to neocons to progressives to liberals to like establishment moderates. It's just like and if your tent is so big then it becomes entirely meaningless. I don't know. I really like Andrew Yang. I, I really, I understand where he's coming from, but I thought, I, yeah, you hate. To, it's like that meme of the worst person you know just made a point. Jim Acosta's got a point.
here. Well, I mean, the problem with the Democrat and Republican parties as they stand is they're too big tent, right? We're trying to cram everybody in the Republican Party who's even remotely on the right and make them fit under a big tent. It doesn't fit very well. And same thing on the left. We need things that are even more niche is what I would say. You need to have, you know, things that really get a bit more into the weeds to better represent people and the ideologies, which would be things like libertarians, neocons, hate to say it, but like people who fall in that bucket, people who fall in the MAGA bucket, which are nationalists. And then on the left, you would want to have things like progressives. You'd want to have old blue dog Democrats. You'd want to have moderate Democrats. Like these are the kinds of um, ways we would need to actually be able to- But they'd be ideological. Organize. Right, the yeah. sorting would be based on principles. Yeah. Uh, let me just show you this tweet, this graphic that Andrew Yang put out that I thought was uh, interesting. So he tweeted, if we stay falsely divided by the media into two camps, we clash and clash and nothing gets done. But if a new dynamic emerges, real change is possible. Then there's this graphic of these two rectangles that says partisans, and then it says forwardists. And it's like a 3D triangle pyramid thing. And I'm just like, like, what the fuck does this mean, bro? Like, this is just... I I want to like you. I want to support you because you seem genuinely like a great guy and you've got these good motives. But this is just utter buzzword meaninglessness. I mean, yeah, I hate to say it, but it is. And, and to say that the media is the one dividing us, that's not true. We are really divided on what we think. And again, that's why you need a whole lot more representation to adequately have everybody be represented in the system, right? It doesn't help me. I'm not going to fit better in a massive big tent with tons of people I disagree with on tons of issues than I am in the GOP. Like, why would I do that? Why would I do that over the LP, right? Where I ostensibly agree with people on a lot more than I do the other parties. That's not the goal of a political party. I think, again, what he wants is bipartisanship or at least like collaboration. And that is better achieved on an issue by issue basis because on an issue by issue basis, I can definitely team up with people across the spectrum on things like criminal justice, on war, on civil liberties, on speech, like on and on it goes. But there's going to be very different coalitions under each of those policy issues that I would team up with to get things done. Um, but this is why, you know, I've told people for a long time, I operate outside the party system, I operate outside the political system, I focus on issue advocacy, on getting things done at the state and local level, and I've had an immense amount of success doing that in ways that have meaningfully impacted and benefited people's lives. That's the strategy that I think makes the most sense, and I, it, I hate to say it, but I think the third party political party initiative is just it's always going to fail because of the barriers already in our system and also like just the lack of organization behind this kind of thing. Yeah, I think issue-based advocacy is a more promising solution. And I think that the fundamental flaw with Andrew Yang's forward party is this idea that rests on that actually Americans agree on everything and it's just the media and the two parties dividing us. When in fact, there are deep rifts and divides between us on what we believe. There are sincerely held fractioning uh, between people with diametrically opposed views on the very essence of this country and our principles and our policies. It's like people want to take us in completely different directions. And I, I, you can't just gloss over that with buzzwords about bipartisanship and unity and common sense solutions. It sounds lovely, but it's no actual re solution in reality. Yeah, I agree. Okay, guys, let's skip to our hot takes. I'll go first. Um, my hot take is, is not controversial, I don't think, but it seems to be something most people don't live by, and it's be on time. If you say you're going to be somewhere at a certain time, be there at that time. I don't know why so many people struggle to just show up on time. I, I really am flabbergasted, and I, I do have a personal like kind of issue with this right now. My, my tennis coach consistently forgets to show up, shows up late, rips off time, I'm not rehiring her. But like, it's very, very frustrating to me. And I was just thinking about it today, like how rude it is and how often people do it. And it's not to say I'm never late. There's been a case, I think on one hand, I could count the times I've been late my whole life, but occasionally something happens, you oversleep, there's traffic you didn't anticipate, that kind of thing. Define late. More than five, 10 minutes. Yeah, I think 10 minutes is very late. Yeah, Passing. okay. Because like two, three, two, I think two to four minutes isn't really yeah. late. You have a five minute window because there might be issues with parking or who knows. You have a five minute window. But after five minutes, you're late. And I think it's incredibly rude. And I think it makes you look super incompetent. Damn. I tell us how you really late. feel. I will. Be on time. <laughs> so my hot take is that there's a big labor shortage right now. Um, but the quality of service in restaurants and bars right now 
is at the lowest I have ever seen it in my lifetime. So, like, we went into somewhere and requested, you know, a table for three. Said it'll be a few minutes. We're like, okay, sure. Uh, but this this young employee is working there who's clearly just hired. Uh, and she then two other groups come in and she seats them at open tables. And she doesn't know how to use the system. When we go back up, she's just confused. And she tells us to wait more. So we just left and went somewhere else. And I'm just like, this is, that's fine. I mean, she's probably like 16 or whatever, just got hired, whatever. But it's like, where's the manager to assist your new employee here? And also just like in general, everywhere there's shortages, signs and whatever. And it's like, when this happens, I've just noticed across the board, like service is not great right now at a lot of places. Uh, And that's unfortunate. I'm somebody who's like, I don't, something crazy would have to happen for me to like not tip. But I do take that into account and leave less of a tip uh, when people, when service is like just truly very bad, which I've had a lot lately. Yeah, we have too. I've seen the exact same thing. And it's just, I want to know, where is your fear of getting fired? Because from the time I first started working on, on the books, which was around 16, I was always terrified of getting fired. Terrified. I just dotted my I's and crossed my T's. I was the best. Like when I worked at a grocery store, I scanned people so fast that people would wait in my line even if another register was open because they knew I was so much faster than everybody else. When I waited tables, I crushed it. I crushed it. I made more more tips than everybody else, and they would all get mad at me. All my colleagues would get mad at me. Like, you just get tips because you're pretty. I'm like, no, I get tips because I'm really good, really good at my job. Like, I don't understand where that urgency is, but you don't see it in the service industry. Well, when there's days. a shortage of labor, they can't fire anybody, so your job's <laughs> completely safe. <laughs> I know, but I mean, I was never in danger of getting fired and I still had a healthy fear of getting fired. I think it's good for people to have a healthy fear of getting fired. So anyways, I I do hate that because I'll throw down for food and drinks and a nice evening, but like the service really does make or break that experience and it is just bleak these days. All right, guys, that's a wrap for this week. We love you so much. Stay based. We'll see you next week.